Good evening, councillors and members in the public gallery. I will officially open this evening's ordinary council meeting at 7pm. Thank you for your attendance tonight. I'd like to remind everyone in the chambers to ensure that comments are respectful to the council and all meeting attendees, including city officers and those in our public gallery. Please note this meeting is being live streamed. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'll move on to item three, which is announcements from the presiding member. I'd like to honour former councillor Graham Pittaway, who served as a council member at the City of Bayswater and passed away on the 14th of January this year. Graham was first elected as a councillor in 2000 and served on numerous boards and committees. He was passionate about developing partnerships and economic development and worked closely with local businesses to promote opportunities for business improvements. Graham was also passionate about community safety and was an active and valued member of the city's Roadwise Advisory Committee. He was also a member of the Robert Thompson Reserve Working Party and liaised with local residents to ensure the $260,000 upgrade of the reserve met the community's needs and aspirations. Graham was chairperson of the Golf Courses Committee and in this role, he ensured that the city's two golf courses were well managed and maintained. He also established charity golf days which raised funds for charities that provided for disadvantaged families and members of the community. These are but a few of Graham's achievements and we remember him as a passionate and valued member of this council. I'd also like to congratulate our Director of Corporate and Strategy, Lorraine Driscoll, on her new role as the Director of Corporate and Commercial at the City of Canning. This is Lorraine's last meeting after two years at the city. She will be missed by both council and staff and we wish her all the best. Thank you. I'll move on to item four, attendance. All councillors are present in the chamber this evening. Move on to applications for leave of absence. Are there any councillors who would like to apply for a leave of absence? No. I'll move on to item five, disclosures of interest. Councillors, do you have any interest to disclose? Councillor Bull. Item 10.4.1, the draft position statement childcare premises. I'm a management committee member of the Bayswater Childcare Association. It's an um, impartiality interest and I'll stay in the room. Item 10.3.2, nature in cities partnership with Greening Australia. Gobba Lake is included in the report and I live opposite Gobba Lake, which is property I own. It's a proximity interest and I'll leave the room for that one. And item 10.1.1, Ward Boundary and Representation Review. I'm the Chair of the Local Government Advisory Board. It's a financial interest and I will leave the room for that one. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mayor. I have one financial interest to disclose. It's item 10.6.1.5, the Review of Procurement Policy. Um, it's a financial interest because on page 319, it lists a number of the regulated entities um, that the ERA, my employer, regulates um, and lists them sort of quite directly and would affect um, whether or not they're in that policy or not. Um, so I'll leave the room for that item and not vote on it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Eason. Uh, yes, mine's 10.5.1, um, the proposed extension of lease. I have a transactional account with um, a Bendigo Bank, so it's impartial and I'll stay in the room. Sorry, do you mind repeating which item number? Yeah, 10.5.1. 10.5.1. Great, thanks. Councillor Johnson. Oh, sorry, you must have turned your mic off and gone back to that. Yeah. Sorry, Sally. If you sorry about that. Sorry. Thank you. My disclosure relates to 10.4.2, proposed naming of laneway within the block 
the street block bordered by Crawford Road, Stewart Street, York Street and Alma Street, Maylands. It's an impartiality interest. Um, my husband and in-laws own a property on the other side of the block, but it shares the laneway. Um, their, their properties in the city of Stirling. Um, so I don't know if it's impacted, but in an abundance of caution, I'll declare that as an impartiality interest and stay in the room. Thank you. Councillor peterson Pick. Yes, I have an impartial interest on item 11.3, Safe Routes to School. My kids attend the Maylands Peninsula Primary School, which is referred to in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Palmer. Thank you. Uh, just a, an impartial interest on the 10.4.1, which is the draft position statement, childcare premises, as uh, chairperson of the childcare centres, Bayswater Childcare Centres. Impartial. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sazowski. Uh, thank you. Um, my interest is for 10.1.1, uh, ward uh, boundary and representation review. Um, the street that I live on is mentioned in that report. Impartial, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maleka. Uh, yes, my interest is with 10.5.1. I bank with Bendigo Bank and have transactional accounts with them. So it's an impartial interest and I'll stay in the room. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to item six, public question time. Members of the gallery, I'll first call for questions on items on this evening's agenda, and then I will open to questions on items not in the agenda. Please keep in mind that you are limited to three questions. Would anyone like to ask a question on tonight's agenda? Yeah. Please come forward to the microphone. Can we move them up? Yeah. I have your name first. Yeah, my name's Andrew Charlotte and I live at 33 Hillside Crescent in Maylands. Yes, we have received um, your questions in writing. Did you okay. wish to ask them? Well, the, uh, yeah, basically um, <clears throat> my question was that I, I wrote was that on the 11th of the 11th last year, um, I happened to be across the Lacey Park uh, with two other members of the public when there is an arsonist attempt, I suppose it's a dramatic word, but um, two young people with a lighter or two lighters were um, trying to set fire to some of the areas of the pavilion at De Lacey Park. The two other members of the public notified the police and the fire brigade, I believe the rangers, and I spoke to the people that were uh, committing the crime, <laughs> if that's the right term. Anyway, they ran off. Um, they'd left a lighter on the barbecue and um, hoping for it to explode, I, I presume. And that they were in a storage area at the back with a lighter trying to set fire to some rubbish in the back. The fire brigade arrived and I spoke to the officer in charge of the vehicle and uh, just discussed different things. He asked me what I'd done and what I'd seen. And I took him round to the back where the storage area was full of um, garbage, wood, rubbish, all sorts. So he said, yep, yeah, th this is a fire hazard, and he looked at other things, and he submitted, I believe, a report to the council with regards to um, it being a hazard. Now, the fire brigade have no r rights to enforce that, so it's left to the general public, I suppose. So after a week, nothing had happened. Um, I phoned the depot, and a lovely young lady spoke to me and um, assured me that she would deal with it. And fair enough, within a week, she'd phoned me back, itemising um, what the council were going to do about that. Um, nothing happened within. She did detail that it would be cleared. The gutters would be cleared. There was an overhanging branch that would be cleared. Because the, <clears throat> the fire officer pointed out that if it had started, it could have caught fire to the um, 
guttering, the overhead tree, there are properties across the road. Now, yes, you know, it, it's a long bow to draw, but it is still a potential uh, fire hazard. So the council would have been obliged to look at it. Um, they didn't. So a fortnight later, I phoned again and I spoke to another person who said, oh, yeah, you phoned up. Um, all I've got here is that you reported it. I said, well, that's not strictly true, but I'm not going to argue over it. What are you going to do with regards to the report? Yeah, we'll send someone out there. Now, a month, six weeks, two months go by, nothing. So I happened to look across, and there were some council employees cutting the grass, doing bits and pieces. So I walked across and said, are you come to sort of clear this out? Nah. We know about it, he said. It's a bit of a laugh at the council because no one will take responsibility whose department it is. So I said, really? Uh, I said, well, I've got a skip over here. I'll take the bloody chairs and I'll put them in there. Well, don't worry, mate. I'll chuck them on the bottom of the back of the truck and we'll take them over and we'll brush a few leaves away. So in fairness to them, they did. I don't suppose they were obliged to, but they did. That's how it stands at this moment. My concern is that I would believe that the council would be hard pushed if it wasn't for the public bringing to their notice things that you couldn't expect people to be out looking at every day on your department, you know, whether it's the roads or buildings or whatever. And I realise that they do have maintenance for the sporting grounds. Um, it seems to be a bit haphazard. I'm lucky enough to live across from De Lacey and I recently retired. I, I don't sit at the window looking at uh, things to complain about. But I think, and the reason I'm here this evening, is I feel that an issue, you know, arson is a, a dramatic word, but it in principle is a, an arsonist's attack. It was done deliberately. It could have created an issue, which I thought the council would have taken a serious note on. But for two of the three of the employees to say, oh, yeah, they know about it, it's just that no one would take any responsibility, tip me to write this letter. This is from Kira Fire Brigade, where the officers turned out at 11.15. Uh, yeah, 11th, 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 10th. <laughs> so um, my question is, I have had cause to speak about issues with the council, with um, councillors Peterkin and um, the deputy mayor, and have had good response. I've got no issues there. But on some occasions, the council itself will say, well, you send me photographs, give me times, give me this, give me that, and the other. So, well, get off your backside and come and have a look. I've given you as much detail as I could. And it's the same in this incident. I gave as much as I believe I should have done, and that I followed it up until I'm here this evening, and that is in the same position it was from the 11th to the 11th, 2022. So, Mr. Charlotte, I'll just get... So, the, your first question is... I've received your questions in writing. Do you have any further questions that you would like addressed this evening? And I can go to um, one of the directors to respond. I, I did put down as an aside uh, a query of when the council were going to maintain the um, reticulation system. Uh, that's purely because that it seems to cost the council an awful lot to keep coming and repairing mistakes that have been made previously. But that's just a side issue. My real issue here this evening is why the incident was not taken seriously. And Thank you would have a notification from the fire brigade. So Thank you very much for that smart. question. I'll go to the director to, for a response. Thank you. Through the chair, um, the city did undertake some maintenance works out there. Uh, end of November, they did remove some branches and there were some cane chairs that were removed. 
and there's some mowing done and I think just recently the gutters have been cleaned uh, on the building so the, the gutter cleaning is basically um, scheduled in it's a routine maintenance um, job that's undertaken by contractors so we do that periodically and that was recently done I will check to make sure that it has been done, but it was booked in, um, I think about a week ago, uh, to have been done. But the chairs were only removed on my request. They weren't removed, they weren't sent there to take those chairs away. And they have not removed <coughs> the um, rubbish that's in the back there. So if I'm not disputing you've had the guts clean, because it would be a preventative maintenance. The overhanging tree has not been removed. So your question is when that will those actions will occur? Uh, yes. I, yes? Yeah, I suppose that's my question. At the end of the day, I'm just bringing it to notice. I'm The outcome of it in the end is to the council, to be quite honest with you. I'm, I'm not there to tell them how to do their job. But I, the fact that it was done so blasé, and um, I did ask if someone would notify me that someone was going to attend. I wasn't going to stand over them and watch them doing it. But I thought, you know, that someone could at least have the decency to say, yes, we've taken you seriously and that these have been done. I, I don't dispute that the maintenance is carried out on a periodic table, but um, that's not the point, really. Yep. It's nearly three months since the incident happened and we're still... Um, you know. Sorry, Mr. Charlotte. Do you just mind standing at the microphone, just so it's being live streamed, so people can hear? Yeah. What you're so saying. I'm just Sorry. saying that my issue is the fact that it was it was treated with sort of a blasé attitude, and that some of the fire material is still there, and that um, if that's not an issue the council wanted to deal with, I I don't know what is. So what we'll do in regards to your question about those action items and when they'll occur and getting back to you with a response of once it's happened, we'll take that on notice and we'll get that um, information to you, a response to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll, it's no yes, question. Yes, sorry, Madam Mayor. Yep. Just because of my name was uh, referred to, I just wanted to let uh, Mr. Charlotte uh, know. Mr. Charlotte? I do not recall, sorry, any email from you, but I, please feel free to email me this again. I respond to every resident all around the city, even from the far end, so I must have not received your email. Yep, look, I understand, and you have responded in the past. Okay, so, so I must have not received the last one. I, I don't didn't remember. send an email to you. Oh, you didn't? No, oh, because okay. I had an intention to come here and speak okay. for myself. Okay, oh, all good, thank you very much. So you obviously got other things, so. Thank you. Would anyone else like to ask a question on an item on this evening's agenda? If not, I'll move to um, questions on items not on the agenda. Come forward, please. I, uh, yeah, the microphone just switched off. Okay. okay. Harry Bazidis, 21 Parkinson Street in Aranda. First of all, thank you, um, uh, Madam Mayor, for um, honouring Graham Pittaway. He was a very good man. Um, recently, I called the City of Bayswater to pursue a long-standing issue. After speaking to the relevant supervisor and being dissatisfied with his response, I asked to speak to the director of that department. I was refused. I then asked to speak to the director's PA. Again, I was refused to be put through. To ensure that there was no misunderstanding and for the sake of clarity, I asked this supervisor if they were denying me access to their upline. I was told that the director does not speak to ratepayers. Immediately after this conversation, I called the city's receptionist and asked to be put through to the director's PA and was successfully connected without issue. My question is, does the City of Bayswater have policies or guidelines regarding ratepayers having access to directors? Thank you for your question. I'll go to the CEO to respond. Yeah, through the Chair, we don't have a policy in relation to that and we wouldn't deny any ratepayer access to a director or the CEO. In that, in that case, can the staff be made aware of this, please? I'll go to the CEO to respond. 
you, through the chair, I'm more than happy to um, portray that message to staff. Okay, thank you very much. Number two, I received a letter, um, I, I recently received a letter addressed to me from the City of Bayswater from a department regarding this same matter. The letter was signed off by the department rather than the author of the letter, similar to the protocol used by legal firms. To this day, I have no idea who penned this letter and who would take ownership of its content. It makes it, makes it difficult for the receiver to respond. It makes me feel that the letter was perhaps scripted by chat GPT. Could the CEO please ensure that staff identify themselves when sending correspondence to ratepayers? Thank you for your question. I'll go to the CEO to respond. Thank you. Through the chair, I'm more than happy to look into that. Ordinarily, all correspondence coming from the city should have a contact number and a person's name there for the constituent or the resident ratepayer to be able to contact. But I'm more than happy to look into that and reconfirm that message. Yeah, thanks very much. This is the first time I've received a department uh, rather than a person yeah. underneath. Yeah. My third question. This morning, I happened to drive down Widgee Road in Naranda. I counted 17 dead, dried up, newly planted verge trees with their stakes still in the ground between McGilvray Ave and Alexander Drive. I've been led to believe that a contractor is employed by the city to water, to water newly planted trees for a period of three years. My street is about 200 to 250 metres long and it has four dead, newly planted trees. I've not seen any active watering truck in Naranda for at least a year. My question is, what measures are in place to ensure that the contractor is actually doing what they've been paid to do? Thank you for your question. I'll go to the director to respond. Thank you. Through the chair, our watering is conducted jointly between contractors and the city. So we've got some trucks that do it as well, as well as contractors. Um, we have got route maps that basically show where the watering needs to happen and we do engage contractors with those route maps and with the specifications stating what they need to do and we do have officers that do go and check and monitor the, the tree health. We are aware that some of the trees die and that is actually a normal process. We do expect to lose some of the trees but in some cases um, some of the losses we are investigating to see what the cause is because there is some areas where we've had um, groupings of trees um, that have died, so we are investigating that and and, uh, and try to get on top of what's going on there. Yeah, I, I, I fully understand and appreciate that sometimes vandalism comes into place, sometimes even the resident may come into place, but these trees were actually dried. They, they lack water and I, I was really alarmed by it and I, I would really like City of Bayswater to to really address this matter because we're wasting our money. Um, and I know the City of Bayswater and the, and the council is doing a great job trying to green our city, trying to Im improve and increase the canopy and all that. And when I see 17 dead trees in about a kilometre of road, that's really alarming for me. Anyway, I'll leave it to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on items not on this evening agenda? No? Well, um, councillors, the city has received questions in writing from three ratepayers. These questions and the responses from officers have been listed in your run sheet and I'll take those as read. I'll now move on to item seven, confirmation, confirmation of minutes for the ordinary council meeting of the 6th of December 2022, incorporating the corrections as specified in the agenda. Do I have a mover? Councillor Palmer, do I have a seconder? Deputy Mayor, I'll put that to the vote. Okay, I'll just go, would the mover like to speak? No. Yeah, would the seconder like to speak? Would anyone like to speak? Councillor Bull. Thank you, I just wanna raise um, another issue with the um, minutes that um, will prevent me from voting on it this evening. I have raised it with the CEO, um, so he will not 
he, he will be aware of it. Um, item 10.3.2 of the minutes includes a motion where council made a, or well, the council is in the room, made a decision to um, determine that uh, Deputy Mayor Councillor Earhart's interest, proximity interest, was an interest in common. It's described as a procedural motion, um, which I couldn't find under the standing orders that kind of motion being a procedural motion, so I suspect that that's not correct. Uh, secondly, the drafting of that motion is not the drafting that was presented in the meeting itself. Um, it's similar, but it's not the same. Um, and I'm of the view that um, what is voted on in a council meeting should be in the minutes. Um, and so on that basis, I won't be confirming these as, a, as an accurate record. Just going to go to the CEO to respond. Yep, through the chair, um, Councillor Bull and I did have a conversation in relation to this yesterday, and I advise Councillor Bull that I would look into the matter and come back to him in relation to that. But seeking that advice within such short notice hasn't allowed me to get back to Councillor Bull this evening. So if Council wanted to, my advice would be is to potentially wait until I can get that advice on the issues that Councillor Bull has raised and you could defer confirming the minutes of the meeting of the 6th of December through to the February meeting of Council whereby that advice in relation to the matters that Councillor Bull has raised can be clarified. Thank you. Councillor Bull, would you like to move a motion to defer this? Unfortunately, I can't because under the standing orders I've already spoken and it's a procedural motion that doesn't allow someone to speak on, so I don't think I'm able to. Councillor Clark, I'm happy to move for motion. To Do I have a seconder to um, second the deferral motion? Councillor Peterson Pick. Councillor Clark, would you like to talk to it? I just, just I think we need to get this sorted and be very clear. I also had an issue on page 15 where I just wanted to <laughs> chase up. I'm frantically trying to do it now um, about my financial interest. It looks like I wasn't in the room, but then returned. But anyway, I'll, I'll go back and double check that as well. So I think that would be good to be able to do that. Councillor Peterson Pick, would you like to speak? Would anyone like to speak on that? Councillor Palmer? Yeah, I'd just like to feel that uh, if there had been uh, some sort of decision made before we actually came into chamber, uh, that before we actually put our hand up to pass those minutes, that should have been uh, given a notice to all of us before, the, before we made a decision to pass the minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Palmer. I can advise that I was not aware of this. Council Bull did not speak to me about it and I haven't heard anything from any member of staff either about this. Just a point of order. Um, it's a procedural motion that only allows the mover to speak. Thanks, Councillor Bull. I'll now put this to the vote. All those in favour? Do I get to... I'll now put this to the vote. All those in favour? That item is deferred. Thank you. We'll now move on to item eight, presentations. Do councillors have any petitions to the table? Councillor Peterson Pick. Thank you. I will read um, the beginning of the petition. Action plan needed for Maylands safe routes to school. The Maylands community calls on the city of Bayswater to deliver a detailed action plan to make Maylands streets safer for kids to walk, scoot and ride to Maylands Peninsula Primary School as part of the City of Bayswater's promised Safe Routes to School project. The plan should include specific implementation actions and timeframes. And there are 245 signatures. And I will table it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a mover and seconder to accept the petition? Mo moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded Councillor Palmer. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you, councillors. 
Does anyone have any presentations to make? No? Any and deputations were heard at last week's agenda briefing forum. Move on to delegates reports, of which we have two this evening. The first is from Councillor Johnson. Councillor, would you like to move this report? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Bull, Councillor Johnson. Thank you. I mean, the reports, as, as I've written, I did make some comments in there, and one of them was um, at the end was to recommend an amendment to the terms of reference for the CEO Review Committee, requiring all elected members to undertake this training. The training was on CEO Performance Review. It was um, very helpful, I think. So I just wanted to note that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bull, would you like to speak? Anyone else like to speak on this? If not, I'll put it straight to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you. That is... Adopted. The second delegate's report is from Councillor Clark. Councillor Clark, would you like to move this report? Do I have, Do I have a seconder? Councillor Bull. Councillor Clark, would you like to make any comments? Um, only to say it was a really good course. It's quite good that it was online as well, so that was really accessible. Councillor Bull, would you like to make any comments? If not, I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you. That is adopted. We'll now move on to item nine, method of dealing with agenda business. And this evening, Councillor Peterson Pick, you are pulling first. Thank you. I actually do not have any items to pull tonight. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> there goes your chance. <laughs> Councillor Vool. Thank you. Uh, 10.2.4. Uh, 10.3.3. 10.4.2 and 10.6.1.3. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move and speak to 10.3.2. I'd like to... Uh, sorry, I'm just having a look at the numbering. Um, I'd like to vote against 10.6.1.2. 10.6.1.2? Yep, that's correct. Yeah. The review of execution of documents on common yep. seal. Yep. Um, and I have some questions for 14.1.5 and perhaps an amendment in confidential. 14.1.5? Yes. Great. It's in confidential. No problem. Thank you. Councillor Johnson? Um. Thank you. I have some questions on four, or a question on 14.1.3, which is in the confidential. Sorry, 14.1.3? Yes. That's the only one? Uh, thank you. Councillor Maleka, Councillor Ossazowski. Uh, thank you. 10.2.7. 10.2.7. Thank you. Councillor Palmer. Thank you. 10.4.1, uh, I'd like to speak a little on that, please. And also 10.6.2.6. Uh, I think that's the one. Or is it 10.6.2.2.5? <laughs> Thank you. That's the uh, progress report, annual progress report, on page 364. 2.2.5. <laughs> that one? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Eason. Councillor Sutherland? Yeah. Deputy Mayor? 10.1.1. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Palmer, I just want to confirm something with you, that second one that you wanted to pull. Just to confirm, it's 10.6.2.5. 10.6.2.2.5. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's the attachment so it in that one. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, councillors, we'll first consider the items that were the subject of deputations. Can I please have a mover and seconder to bring items 10.4.2 and 10.5.1 forward to the beginning of section 10 for discussion. 
before we resume the order of business as set out in the agenda. Moved by Councillor peterson Peak, seconded by Councillor Eveson. I'll put that straight to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. So we'll start with item 10.4.2, proposed naming of laneway within the street block bordered by Crawford Road, Stewart Street, York Street and Alma Street, Maylands. Councillor Bull, you pulled this one. Yes, I wish to not move it. Move, okay. So, um, Deputy Mayor, you wish to move the officer's recommendation. Do I have a seconder? This is 10.4.2, proposed naming of the laneway in Maylands. Do I have a seconder to move, seconded by Councillor Eveson? Deputy Mayor, would you like to speak? Councillor Eveson? Would anyone like to speak against? Councillor Bull. Thank you. Uh, and th thanks to the officers for the report. Uh, it's a it's a five-page report with six sentences about the two people who were being asked to consider naming um, this. And it really doesn't go into much detail at all. We know where each person was born. Um, we know the date or roundabout. Um, we know which school they went to and when they died um, and nothing more. And so I think in order to make a decision around naming um, anything, uh, we, I think it's important to have some uh, further information in order to actually understand why um, the, the people who are being presented should be are more worthy of it than other people. Um, and there's just not enough information for me to be able to make that decision. They, they also don't know whether the families have been um, consulted or not um, either, just as an aside. And on this basis, I can't support this. Thank you. Would anyone like to speak for? Councillor Sazowski. I have a question. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, in the officer's recommendation as it stands, it says in here um, that uh, this is to go out to public advertising. So in this, that's in limb one and also in limb two, it's talking about referring it back to council for further consideration following public advertising. So when it's publicly advertised and then this has to then come back to council, another report will be created. Is that correct? I'll go to the um, governance manager. And when that report comes back to us, oh, I mean, sorry, let me go back a step. When public adver advertisements occur, does that usually bring to the city new information about issues that are being publicly advertised? So by publicly advertising, is there the potential that the community will see that and reach out to us and tell us more about this? Happy to go to the governance manager to respond. Uh, normally, when uh, an item goes out for public consultation, there'll be a summary of submissions that will be presented back to council when it comes when the item comes back to council, and that summary of submissions may raise new information for council to consider. Thank you. Would you like to speak on it? Anyone speaking for? Anyone against? If not, I'll go to the mover to close. I'll put it straight to the vote. All those in favour? That's Councillor Maleka, Councillor Ossozowski, Councillor Eason, Councillor Sutherland, Deputy Mayor, Councillor peterson Peak, Councillor Clark, Councillor Johnson and myself. All those against? Councillor Palmer and Councillor Bull. That is carried. Okay, we'll now move on to item 10.5.1, proposed extension of the lease, King William Street. Um, would anyone like to move the officer's recommendation? Councillor Eveson, do I have a seconder? Councillor Palmer. Councillor Eveson, would you like to speak to it? Yes. Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have got a long-standing relationship with the Bendigo Bank in a very supportive manner for our community. And I think this uh, says it all. The fact that uh, we had the chairperson coming in, uh, who was a previous uh, chair here and also chair of the bank, um, and also the fact that the community do support uh, the, the only bank in that part of uh, the city of Bayswater, uh, I feel it's very, very uh, 
obliged to be there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone speaking against? Councillor Clark? I just had a quick question. Just on the <coughs> language in the officer's recommendation on page 239, so it's the terminate, they would terminate the lease and then it would be, sorry, I'm just triple checking, I'm not reading something out that's confidential. No. Um, okay, and then we would, and then it's disposal by lease of the building. That's not actually a disposal of the asset from the city, is it? That's just putting it out to, for lease against just the particular yes. language. Yep, thank you. Would you like to speak on it? Anyone speaking for? Anyone against? Would the mover like to close? I'll put that straight to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. So those are all the items that were subject to a deputation. So we'll now move on to the remaining items that have been pulled by councillors. The first one being 10.1.1, Ward Boundary and Representation <coughs> Review pulled by the Deputy Mayor. Are you moving the officer's recommendation? Oh, sorry, we'll just wait for Councillor Bull to leave the room. Deputy Mayor, are you moving the officer's recommendation? Yeah. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Sutherland, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'll just be really quick on this one. I just wanted to um, thank the officers for um, including all of the feedback that was received on that. It was a very interesting read and um, it was really pleasing to see that there was such engagement with this one. Um, in an ideal world, of course, it would have been three or four times more engagement than that. But um, as I think it's by leaps and bounds above any other ward review that we've done previously. So, um, yeah, very, very interesting read and I support the officers' recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Sutherland. Yeah, I don't really have much to uh, add to that. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the officers for this report, very succinct. Um, I think it's good to see the community agrees to keep the ward system. Um, I think the number of people engaged in the, or that, that wrote back in the engagement in my mind means that the people that didn't say anything are happy with business as usual. I find with engagement people are either really happy with something or really unhappy, they're not in between. So I think that they're really ha uh, happy with the ward system. I think as councillors, people, we have to remember, you know, we've got a good knowledge of our area and um, I think it's uh, good to, to keep business as usual. So yeah, well done. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak against? Councillor Clark. Oh, I may not be against, but I wish to speak if that's all right. Um, so if anyone did want to speak against beforehand, <laughs> go, before go ahead. Me, jump in. Um, so I'd like to thank the officers for the work they did on this in the consultation. Um, just to make a couple of comments, because I think this is really fundamental. This is about our democracy and how it works um, at a really local level. Um, I fundamentally don't necessarily agree that we should have less elected members. Um, obviously, going from 11 till 9, that is less representation for um, our electors. Um, that is obviously something that is imposed upon us uh, by the state government, and we don't have a choice in that matter. But I think people will see um, a reduction in responsiveness and the ability of nine people rather than 11 people to actually get back to them and represent their interests. Um, so I, I actually think we have a a relatively good number and it is a good workload, um, but uh, we obviously don't have any scope to change that. Um, I'm very glad that um, those who were consulted uh, saw value in the wards. Um, I've spoken before about how much I think the wards really do enhance how we advocate on behalf of local people. Um, what I know is happening down at Bayswater train station is I'm much closer to that compared to something that's happening up in Naranda, for example. Um, now I can drive up to Naranda and have a look based on items that are going on, but I am not buying my bread and milk up there. So um, I think that makes a huge difference in, um, in the representation and how we actually go about our jobs as elected uh, members. Um, I do think in the future we're going to need to look more closely at the number of electors per elected member and the deviations. Um, I did query some of the deviations. I understand there'll be some corrections issued and I hope they're in the minutes so everyone can see the correct calculations of the deviations. Um, this goes to the idea of one, one vote, one value. Um, from, a, from a really sort of... Um, I suppose really high, you know, high level, um, someone's vote in one area shouldn't be worth less than a vote in another area. And we still actually have essentially a bit of malapportionment. I know that they're 
we're trying to build in areas of growth and predict where there might be growth, and we might not be able to get that prediction 100% spot on, but essentially um, a vote in, you know, say, South Ward shouldn't be worth more than, than North Ward, um, or, or more or less. It should be as equal and even as we can possibly get it, and I think we could actually get closer um, to one vote, one value on this. But otherwise, um, I know there's a lot of change coming at us in the next four years, and um, uh, look forward to everyone implementing the recommendations. Thank you, Councillor. And I just wanted to clarify that those um, corrections that you were referring to are in the supplementary information that's been provided. So that's all done. Will, will that be in the minutes then or not? Does that then in some way go into the minutes? I'll just go to the governance manager to confirm. Through the chair, because we've issued a supplementary agenda where you can see the corrections have been made, the minutes will just reflect the corrected information. Thank you. Would anyone like to speak for? Anyone against? If not, I'll go to the mover to close. Nothing to add? I'll go to the vote. All those in favour? Oh, just just a question. Sorry, is one of the items need absolute majority to be vote that separate or is it all voted at once? I'm just putting it all at one. Yeah. I'll put that... No, she didn't. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? That is Councillor Maleka, Councillor Osazowski, Councillor Palmer, Councillor Eason, Councillor Sutherland, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Peterson Pitt, Councillor Clark, and myself. All those against? Councillor Johnson. That is carried. Can we please get Councillor Bull back in the room? Councillor Bull, for your information, the officer's recommendation was carried. So we'll now move on to the next item, which was pulled, which is 10.2.4, list of payments for the month of December. Councillor Bull, you pulled this one. Vote against. Would anyone like to move the officer's recommendation? Councillor Sutherland, do I have a seconder? Councillor Johnson. Councillor Sutherland, would you like to speak to it? Councillor Johnson. Would anyone like to speak against? Anyone speaking for? If not, I'll go straight to the vote. All those in favour? That is Councillor Maleka, Councillor Osazowski, Councillor Palmer, Councillor Eason, Councillor Sutherland, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Peterson Pitt, Councillor Clark, Councillor Johnson and myself. All those against? Councillor Bull, that is carried. So the next item is 10.2.7, exemption from rates, Centre Care Incorporated. Councillor Osazowski, you pulled this one. Um, I'm just pulling it to vote against it, thank you. Do I have someone who'd like to move the officer's recommendation? Moved by Councillor Palmer, seconded by Councillor Peterson Pitt. Councillor Palmer, would you like to speak? Thank you. This is a charitable organisation. Um, so I haven't got any words uh, ready, so I'm just saying from the top of my head, it suits the actual uh, guidance of section six, where it does uh, purport to be charity, education, uh, or religious instruction and so forth. It fits the bill. Uh, this is a charitable organization. It's helped many people and it will carry on doing that. It does not have any profitable issue. It takes rent, which pays for the means it has to have. Uh, and I feel it fits the bill completely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor peterson Peak. Yeah, look, just to concur with uh, Councillor Palmer, this is a charity that helps um, people living in our city. Um, it meets all the criteria, so it's quite straightforward. It should be supported by Council. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak against? Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Um, sure, it meets the definition of a charity. Um, it, it meets the guidelines for an exemption. Um, I will be supporting it, but noting that um, if it had have been owned as it previously was by Department of Housing, they would have paid rates to us. And um, the rent that the people are paying is probably fixed to their income, so it neither goes up or down whether we give them a rent exemption. So we're supporting the not-for-profit by doing that, and that's a housing organisation that's fine. Um, but I do know that lots of other local governments um, are, have been wrestling with this and rate reductions, and we're going to be in the same boat if the Department of Housing keeps handing its housing to not-for-profit organisations that get rent exemptions. So um, I'm hoping that we will be advocating to the state government um, to, to be more consistent with how this is applied. Thank you. Anyone speaking for? Question. 
You have a question, Councillor Eastley? Yeah, that's probably just uh, Councillor uh, Johnson's remarks regarding um, what's, do we have any idea of what the size of this is for, the, for our city in regards to charitable organisations currently? Size of what? As in the quantity of, of charitable organisations that this exemption is being applied for? Uh, I'll go to the director. Uh, thank you, through the mayor. Just to clarify, sorry, were you asking the how many charitable orgs? There's about 150 in the city. Yeah. So and just to follow on, so how many and then I guess what's the impact on rates for that? Is there, can we provide that figure? Yeah, it's approximately a million dollars, just over a million dollars. Oh, okay. Thank you. Would you like to speak on the item? Anyone speaking for? Anyone speaking against? Councillor Sutherland? Um, probably in the same vein as Councillor Johnson, but I'm probably going to be a killjoy and vote against it. But again, um, just to bring it to Council's attention, we just heard how much it's costing us. And I think when you've got councils closer to the CBD, like us and a, a few others, um, obviously we're going to get more bombarded more with um, uh, NGOs trying to supply housing for, for people. Um, just quickly, I've done a bit of reading on this, but uh, these services do belong to state governments and they're very clever, the government, by passing it on to in, um, not for profit and then they, um, you know, that, that puts an impost on councils. Um, you know, it's been, they've had state governments of all persuasions have had a policy since the 90s not to build state housing and to on, put it on to, to not for profit. And um, us being the, the lowest rung in the ladder, we're the ones that get um, clearly uh, affected by it in terms of um, money. So I think um, the government should step up to the plate, especially this one. We've got lots of money now in the kitty, and um, it would be great to see a few more built or taken off the hands of NGOs so we can have a few more rates. Thank you. Would anyone like to speak for? Anyone against? If not, I'll go to the mover to close. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I actually feel that we're sort of going a little bit overly broad. Uh, this is one house uh, in one suburb in the city of Bayswater that has requested this. Uh, it's not a million dollars to these people. That is an overall assumption for centre care or whatever. This is an NGO. It's not their fault if the government has a policy or a state government has a policy in which they hand over people who they cannot uh, take a rental to, and they, an NGO has the ability with volunteers to actually say, yes, we'll house those people. Where, where do you draw the line? This is NGOs, and these are volunteers, uh, and they help people who are homeless. And I think uh, we're very, very well equipped to pay for their rates. Thank you. Thank you. I now put this to the vote. All those in favour? That's Councillor Naleka, Councillor Palmer, Councillor Eveson, Councillor peterson Pitt, Councillor Bull, Councillor Clark, Councillor Johnson and myself. All those against? Councillor Ossozowski, Councillor Sutherland and the Deputy Mayor. That is carried. So we'll now move on to the next item, which is 10.3.2. Councillor Bull, you have proximity interest. Nature in Cities Partnership with Greening Australia. This is being pulled by Councillor Clark. Councillor Clark, are you moving the officer's recommendation? Do I have a seconder? Councillor um, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Clark. Um, thank you, Mayor. I wanted to move this item and speak briefly to it. Um, obviously, there's quite a lot of detail in the report. It's, it's obviously had a lot of work done to it. Um, and I think we've got a good plan for what we can deliver down on this site. Um, I think the overarching thing, I've had a number of local residents ask me about this, particularly when is it, when does it get started, when do we plant the first tree? Um, and the answer to that that I've received is in winter 2024 um, at this point. Um, but obviously we've still got a fair bit of work to do, including um, partnering and also finding some more money, so doing some more advocacy uh, to find additional funds for this. Um, but the idea is that we would um, build an urban forest down near the river. It would expand upon Eric Singleton Bird Sanctuary. Um, arguably, as well, going into the future, provide a biodiversity connection between Gobba Lake and Eric Singleton Bird Sanctuary. Um, and I think this is... I particularly want to move this and speak to it because when you actually look at climate change maps of this area down at Riverside Gardens... Um, half of Riverside Gardens ends up underwater in the next 20 to 30 years. 
Um, so we are going to have to do some more work in terms of providing more public open space that is actually sort of arguably further up the hill. Um, and I think the more that we can do that in terms of that link to Gobba Lake, but also in, in some of that um, land that hasn't yet been built on uh, closer towards the Tonkin, um, the better that we can, we can do that and plan for climate change mitigate those um, climate change impacts. Uh, so as I say, I look forward to the continued advocacy from the obviously the CEO and the Mayor in terms of obtaining additional funds um, and how we find additional funds in our budget negotiations, uh, but I look forward to the first tree planting. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Deputy Mayor? Uh, I just want to say I think that um, it's got, we, that I know that um, both yourself, Madam Mayor, and um, so I've been working really hard in in speaking with potential partnership opportunities and uh, it's exciting. So I'm looking forward to, I think, Greening Australia will um, help deliver um, a great result down there. Thank you. Would anyone like to speak against? Anyone for? Councillor peterson Pick. Thank you. I just want to, um, so last week at the agenda briefing form, I asked um, several questions about the previous advice that we received several years ago from the officers that there may be risks of planting trees at that location because of the contamination. Um, recently, we had advice that we have a study that confirms that trees can be planted on the site and there are no risks anymore. Can I please confirm that from the officers, please? Thank you. I will go to the relevant director. Yeah, through the chair. The study shows that um, there is sufficient cover on the site. Um, it does vary across the site, so some places are a bit thicker than others. And um, basically, once the design gets drawn up, the appropriate vegetation will be put into the right places to, uh, to make sure that um, it suits the soil conditions in those locations. Thank you. And I so understand that the city does, do not have any concerns anymore about the site. I'll go can to mitigate. We can, can. Can we mitigate those concerns that you previously had? Through the chair, that that's correct, uh, and that will be done through the design process. Would anyone like to speak against? Anyone for Councillor Sutherland? Yeah, I am um, too a big supporter of this. I think it's great. Um, I like the idea of expanding the offset planting. I think it's a great initiative um, and I think this is um, the amount of trees that we've lost in due to infrastructure upgrades around the city has been obvious and I think it should be a no-brainer that the state government could give us um, some more funds uh, for this because they're our natural assets so that's you know that expansion of offset planting uh, offset planting is a really good idea uh, and it can be you know, more, use more around the city. Also, I just want to take this opportunity to remind council, I was reminded at the NMRC um, the other night about, or um, before Christmas actually about this. The federal government now has, um, is sitting on a pile of money around $1.2 billion worth, um, and it's in a climate change uh, initiative fund. Um, and that bucket of money is supposed to be for not just um, you know, infrastructure, but for things like greening Australia and plant, you know, planting trees and that sort of thing. So it would be good to see if we could do some investigation and in getting a bit of money on um, from that as well. So, Thank yep. you. Anyone speaking against? Anyone speaking for? Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Um, I probably want to commend the council for working with so many partners on, on this. Um, having Green Australia on board is, is going to be a, re is a really good relationship, but also has the potential to be a really um, a signature project for all of the organisations involved in it. And, um, and, and I look forward to further engagement with our First Nations uh, folk in, in making this a really important project. There's a lot of excitement in the community about it. Thank you. Anyone speaking against? Anyone speaking for? Councillors, um, I wish to enter debate. And as you uh, may recall, a memo was sent out earlier this week um, about uh, a change in process when the presiding member wishes to enter debate or move a motion. So um, as I wish to debate this, I'd like to hand over chairing of the meeting now to the deputy mayor. And I will, um, in the interest of good governance, so um, once I finish debating, I'll take over chairing again. So, Deputy Mayor. 
you can. Thank you, Madam Mayor, if you'd like to yes. speak for. Thank you. So um, I'm really supportive of what's in front of us. I think this is an ex excellent example of how this council is committed to finding opportunities to partner with the private sector to deliver outcomes for our community without go always going with our hand out to the ratepayers. We are thinking outside of the box and looking for innovative solutions. By entering this agreement, the City of Bayswater will be the first Nature in Cities site in Perth, with the potential for this to become the flagship project in WA. This is huge and exciting, and I'm really happy to hear that councillors are supportive of this, and I hope it gets through. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll hand the chair back to you. Thank you. I'll now take over chairing. I'll go to the mover to close. Councillor Clark. Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you to everyone for the comments. Um, I think, obviously, it's a huge project and there are some risks. I take um, Councillor um, Peterson Pick's point. I, years ago, I do remember actually reading the report about contamination and it being a historical landfill site and remember thinking, oh, well, that might be tricky, um, but I'd not insurmountable, I think, is, is, the, is the way that we go forward on that. Um, and obviously the offsets will be, um, will be key as well. I know there's obviously been um, a, quite, quite a few um, national reviews and um, issues around the integrity of offsets. Uh, but again, I think that is something that can be managed um, as long as, and I think that's something that local councils will be looking at around the country. Um, a number of councils over east, I know, um, are reviewing their offset policies to actually make sure there's actually integrity in it um, rather than sort of purchasing things that are overseas and then not quite knowing what's happening overseas um, to reach their um, their carbon uh, carbon targets. Uh, so I think this will make a huge difference. I think we've all got to put our thinking caps on to find the extra money, uh, whether that be from government, from private sector or from our own budget um, because I think we need to get cracking uh, with building this and the community is really keen uh, to see it happening. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now put this to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. Can we please get Councillor Bull back in the room? Excuse me, Chair. I um, wanted to pull 10.3.3. I might have neglected to do so. Uh, Councillor Bull pulled it. Councillor Bull, for your information, the officer's recommendation was um, carried. So we'll now move on to item 10.3.3, EMRC Council Meeting Minutes 24 November and spe Special Council Meeting Minutes 19th of December. Councillor Bull, you pulled this one. Are you moving the officer's recommendation? Uh, uh, just a couple of quick questions first and then I'll work out ahead. on it. Yeah, cool, thanks. First, I was wondering if someone, uh, one of the councillors who's on the EMRC probably best place to give, um, would be able to provide an update on uh, where EMRC is at with the departure of Belmont from the EMRC? That's my first question. So I'll go to the director. Um, yeah, through the chair, I, I probably can't actually provide a full update on, on that. I actually have a meeting on Thursday to um, with, with the technical officers to um, discuss various matters. So at this point in time, I don't have information on that. It's okay. It was question wasn't really to the director, but that's okay. Um, and then also I saw in the minutes, Kalamunda is referred to as well as leaving. So is there an update on that one? I'll go to the director. Yeah, through the chair, similar response to that. It's gonna be discussed on Thursday. Okay. Right, uh, and my last question is whether there is an update that can be provided by the EMRC members who are here on the on where we're at with the Fogo plant tender. So, um, Councillor Sutherland, did you wish to speak on that? Councillor Johnson was going to speak on that. Councillor Johnson, would you like to answer that? Um, sure. I mean, I can only note that it was. Um, uh, referred to in, in the minutes that are attached and it says the current tender process for a permanent FOGO processing facility um, be cancelled and the preferred tender be advised and um, and uh, the council will 
can, the EMRC will continue with the implementation of a permanent FOGO processing facility in the near future. And I haven't got any more information I can share at the moment on that. Thank you. A lot of that is obviously behind closed doors. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Sutherland. Councillor Bull? Thanks. So in light of that, can I please propose a, an amended motion? Have you provided the wording to the well, city? Well, I, I have it now. I have the wording now. So the, the city, the minute taker has it? Well, I've only just been thinking about it. So, no, it's written down in front of me. Okay. Yep. So it would be um, based on the officer's recommendation, but it would be that council um, paragraph one, Uh, and then the tracking follows, receives the e Eastern Metropolitan Regional Council EMRCs. Um, instead of LIM 1, that's renumbered A, unconfirmed meeting minutes and information bulletin from the council meeting held on 24 November 2022. And then LIM 2 is uh, renumbered B, unconfirmed minutes from the special council meeting held on 19 December 2022. Uh, the full stop is turned into a semicolon followed by the word and, and there's a paragraph and introducing a new limb. So this will be limb two. Requests the CEO to write to the EMRC chair and CEO requesting a briefing on the progress of the FOGO plant tender, full stop. Can yeah. you please confirm that wording? That looks good, correct? thank yeah. you. So that's your what you're moving. Do yes. I have a seconder? Councillor Johnson, Councillor Bull? Uh, thank you, uh, well, I think it's pretty important that uh, we se we receive an update on um, the status of the FOGO plant tender, particularly given that there is little information that's able to be provided um, publicly um, and most particularly given the um, information that was just referred to by uh, Councillor Johnson. Um, also, I think it would be given an opportunity to see if we can get a bit more information on what's happening with the exit of Belmont. Um, time has passed and um, actually also Kalamunda as well. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Um, sure. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I, I was very disappointed um, by, the, by that outcome um, and, and, and I don't know how that impacts on Bayswater and its um, FOGO future, so I think it'd be really useful for councillors to get as much information as they could. Thank you. Would anyone like to speak against? Anyone for? Councillor Sutherland? Um, yeah, look, I think it's a good idea if we could have uh, the CEO come and, and give us a bit of an update. Um, I, I did ask, I think, in November when, when um, Kalamunda said that they were going, uh, I thought, you know, we better have somebody come and talk to us because now 33% of our councils are gone when we decided we were going to have FOGO. So there's a, and that was one reason why I didn't support the strategic plan because two councils are going. Um, we might need to think about that again and, you know, I know you were the same. So I just wanted to add that in. So good idea. Thank you. Anyone speaking against? Anyone for? Councillor Ossasaski. Thank you. And just to chime in on that as well, um, I think it's a great idea that we do get the CEO to write to, to the EMRC chair and the CEO because this, this, these topics are so complex and, you know, there's stuff that can be public and stuff that can't be public and it, it's quite confusing. Um, so I think that's a, a good idea to, 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 to get an update from, you know, the horse's mouth, so to speak. So, yeah, cool. Thank you. Anyone speaking against? Anyone for? If not, I'll go to the mover to close. 
I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. So we'll now move on to item 10.4.1, draft position statement, childcare premises. Councillor Palmer, you've pulled this. Are you moving the officer's recommendation? Yes, I am, Madam Chair, yes. Thank you. Do I have a Madam seconder? Yeah. Councillor Sutherland, Councillor Palmer. Thank you. Uh, I do believe this is one of uh, the most important childcare premise uh, state government uh, the drafts that have appeared. Uh, they talk mainly of the health uh, and protection of the childcare premise where it should not be near any uh, traffic, uh, pollution and so forth. Uh, the officers have made uh, their own slight recommendations with regard to time planning uh, 24, I think, um, and there are issues of our planning amendments to, to knit into that and weave into that very slight but very necessary uh, but I believe uh, overall uh, where we see uh, children that are going to be in a play area outside maybe for two or three hours and if that play centre is uh, adjacent to a high traffic area that is really toxic uh, so this act uh, this draft uh, hopefully it will go, go through is tremendously important for all our child cares in uh, Bayswater. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sutherland. Would anyone like to speak against? Anyone for? If not, I'll put that straight to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. So we'll now move to the next item, which is 10.6.1.2. Review of execution of documents and common seal policy. Councillor Clark, you've pulled this one. Are you moving officer's recommendation? Uh, no, I wish to vote against. Oh, okay. Um, do I have someone who would like to move the officer's recommendation? Councillor Sutherland, do I have a seconder? Councillor Eason, Councillor Sutherland, Councillor Eason. Anyone speaking against? Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, it might seem an odd <laughs> and obscure item to, to speak against on, but um, I come back to something that I've raised before in this chamber for years and years about delegations um, and the, where the buck stops. The buck stops with us as elected officials, um, but also where things are delegated from us to the CEO. In looking at who can sign a contract or a document and essentially execute documents, um, I'm not comfortable with it essentially going lower to another level um, uh, within the organisation. Um, I do think some of this should be at a much higher level um, given given that there's there's risks around around that. That's not to say that, you know, I'm not casting aspersions on anyone in the organisation, but I think it's about the systems that we build in um, to mitigate risks um, around uh, signing documents and who, who can do that when and how often and when, when that becomes a fraud risk or not. Um, and I just, from a point of principle, think that the people at the top who are accountable should be signing these documents. Thank you. Anyone speaking for? Anyone speaking against? If not, I'll go the mover to close. No, I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? That's Councillor Maleka, Councillor Ossozowski, Councillor Eason, Councillor Sutherland, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Johnson and myself, all those against, Councillor Palmer, Councillor peterson Pick, Councillor Bull and Councillor Clark. That is carried. So the next item is 10.6.1.3, Policy Review, Appointment of an Acting or Temporary CEO. This has been pulled by Councillor Bull. Are you moving the officer's recommendation? Uh, no, it's to vote against. Would anyone like to move the officer's recommendation? Councillor Sutherland, seconded by Councillor Eason. Councillor Sutherland? Yeah. Councillor Eason, anyone wish to speak against? Councillor Bull? Yes, please. Um, I was actually hoping the mover or the seconder would share their views on this because I was hoping to hear, like, understand the thinking behind the amendments to this from their perspective. Anyhow, um, in absence of that, uh, I think that the ability for the mayor to approve four weeks leave um, of the CEO is too long. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the CEO isn't employed by the mayor um, and the CEO doesn't actually report to the mayor. And um, it, given the way in which the structure works, 
um, I have seen firsthand how um, some confusion can start to develop around that. It's really important to make sure that um, that everyone is aware of what their roles are at um, any local government. Um, and on that basis, um, I think mistakes can inadvertently be made. Uh, and on, on that basis, and in absence of anything to help me understand why it's okay, um, I'm not going to support the proposed changes to this policy. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak for? Councillor Clark? Can I ask a question? Go ahead. So, now, on page 279, it talks about the revision and the rationale. So, the Mayor to approve periods of leave not exceeding four weeks. So, it's revised to allow the Mayor to approve periods of leave not exceeding four weeks. So, what currently happens? in up to four weeks. I'll go to Someone the... Can refresh my memory. I'll go to the CEO to respond. So through the chair, currently within the policy, any leave that the, um, the CEO is proposed to take as per the contract requires council approval. So I would need to come to council to seek that approval to, um, to seek that leave. Did you wish to speak on it? No. Anyone speaking for? Anyone against? Councillor Peterson-Pick. Yeah, look, I was convinced by Councillor Bull's arguments. Um, I'm also concerned about this change. I, I think this is... You can see how it will undermine council as a council. Um, I've been here for five years, don't remember any issues with leave of CEOs or any CEO previous or current raising issues. So I would prefer first to see problems before we change the policy so drastically to remove council from a decision making making um, kind of level. Thank you. Anyone speaking for? Anyone against? Anyone for? Deputy Mayor? Thank you. Um, I just see this as a simple policy. It's for leave for the CEO. It's not any other decision-making capacity, and I see the policy as delegating that council body decision to the mayor to make on a leave. It's leave. It's nothing. Um, you know, people should be allowed to take leave from work. Thank you, um, councillors. I believe the CEO would like to make a few comments, which I will allow. Through the chair, councillors, just in re in relation to this, um, the way the current contract is worded is all leave requests need to be approved by council. So that's when, um, as a CEO, I would take an executive day off, um, a sick day, personal leave or any other provisions and leave up to that period of four weeks. So it would mean on cases whereby if I took sick leave and more recently a personal leave request through, through the mayor and council, I wouldn't be able to do that because I would not be able to fulfil my contractual requirements, which is to get council to actually approve that. Um, it was probably something that was overlooked from a contractual point of view when I signed the contract, and it is purely just to um, expedite those up to a period of four weeks, or even a period of two weeks. Um, it's just to make it um, easier for those leave approvals to come through. Thank you, Mr CEO. Would anyone like to speak against? Councillor Peterson Peake. Yeah, can I just ask a question? Yeah. Following the CEO's clarification, what was the process um, with the previous CEO? I'll go to the CEO to respond. Yeah, through the mayor, I can't comment on previous CEO contracts in terms of the conditions that you actually um, had with that CEO because I'm not aware of that. I can only comment on the contract that the council has with me currently. So the issue, sorry, follow up question. So the issue is because of the contract and not because um, an approach taken on an ongoing basis with all CEOs? So through the chair, if I was to comment in relation to all CEOs, all of my previous contracts with other councils over the past 10 years has allowed for the mayor or the shy president to approve those leave requests up to a period that the council would agree to. That is um, normal standard practice within a CEO contract. But as I said, um, during the contract negotiations for my appointment, that was something that I overlooked. Otherwise, I would have raised it at that time with the council. Thank you. Just another question, if I can. And what happens in a situation where the mayor refuses to approve an annual leave of four weeks, for example? What would happen then? 
Well, then I don't take the leave, councillor, um, because the, the mayor the makes mayor, the decision. So yeah. it will not come back to council. Yeah. Or I could request that the mayor, if the mayor refused that, then I could make the request that it would come to council for consideration. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this? If not, I'll go to the mover to close. I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? That's Councillor Maleka, Councillor Palmer, Councillor Eveson, Councillor Sutherland, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Clark, Councillor Johnson and myself. All those against? Councillor Peterson Pick and Councillor Bull. That is carried. Okay. We'll now move on to the next item, which is 10.6.1.5, Review of Procurement Policy. Councillor Clark, you'll be leaving the room. Do I have someone who'd like to move this item? It is 10.6.1.5, Review of Procurement Policy. No, there's a financial interest. So um, no one's pulled it, but we need to consider it. Can I have a mover? Councillor um, Sutherland, seconded Deputy Mayor, Councillor Sutherland, Deputy Mayor. Would anyone like to speak against? Anyone for? If not, I'll put it straight to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. Can we please get Councillor Clark back? Councillor Clark, the officer's recommendation was carried. So we'll now move on to item 10.6.2.5, quarterly performance review, corporate quarter one. Councillor Palmer, you've pulled this one. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the item um, originally you... uh, is 10.6.2.2, the quarterly performance review, corporate strategies. Oh, um, okay. So the new limb that I'm requesting, uh, it concerns 10.6.2.2.5 within that. Okay. okay, so the item, just to clarify for council, it's 10.6.2.2, quarterly performance review, corporate strategies, quarter three and four, 2021 Thank slash you. 22, and it's referring to the report. That's all right. Okay, are you moving the officer's recommendation? What I'd like to do is add a new limb uh, to what already exists. And has that wording been provided to uh, yes, it the has. city? Yes, and if I can read that to you. Yes. Um, that council requests that a further report is provided to the next audit and risk management committee on item 10.6.2.2.5, table four, the annual progress report town centre activation plan for Noanda, specifically in relation to the action item to create freely available youth space. And I, if I can explain that. I'll just um, get the minute taker to fix up the word. It shouldn't be activation, it should be in relation to the action item. So we'll just get that corrected first. Specifically in relation to the activation to create truly available. Specifically in relation to the action item, not yes, activation. Action item. Yeah. To the action item. Okay, Councillor Palmer. Thank you very Sorry, much. I'll just see if there's a seconder. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Peterson-Pick, Councillor Palmer. Thank you. Um, it's a fairly straightforward one. Looking within the actual space that they've given, uh, they've actually, it's, it's, I don't mean to say it's misleading, uh, but it's, it's a little bit of a mistake. It actually says on uh, the creation of a freely available youth space, such as a basketball court, beach volleyball court or mini skate park. Now, when you go across on that comment, it says complete. So that, I feel, is a little bit misleading. Uh, then you go across and it says a newly freely available youth nature play space created in Noanda Nook. Now, that's all correct. 
That is on page 364. It's page 14 of the attached item. So it's page 14 of the attachment, okay? Uh, and if you, uh, it's in the Noanda section, table four, uh, around the middle, middle of it. Um, and it creates the view that that has been expected in the Noanda Nook. Now, we all know Noanda Nook is a very nice, vibrant, young space. It is not a youth space. And to actually have a basketball and a volleyball or anything like that in that area, unless we use the football area, uh, is highly unlikely. So I think that uh, statement needs to be recorrected. And rather than go into the issue, if we bring this back, uh, that council requests that a further report is provided, I think that's a much easier way of going, and that can be explained then for the audit people. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor peterson Pick. Anyone speaking against? I've got a question. Go ahead. So my, my question is in relation to this one. Um, it doesn't mention anything about the ping pong table. Was the ping pong ta table supposed to be a replacement for any of those? I just want to know where that fits into. I'll go to the director. Through, um, through the chair, the, um, we'll address that as part of the further report, but <coughs> it, it was, it, the, the play space elements are pretty much as what was, my understanding is what was consulted with the community. Um, so that was the intention of the comments, um, but I appreciate that there's maybe a bit of confusion in regards to the basketball, mention of the basketball courts in that, in that context, but um, the, my understanding there was no actually basketball courts proposed, for example, within the actual play space. Yes, space, sorry. Thank you. Um, would you like to speak to it, Deputy Mayor? Anyone speaking for Councillor Eason? I just had a question because I do recall following this up with the city officers. So what, was a basketball court included in the scope? Because I, I never recall seeing that in any of the master planning for that site. I'll go to the director. To the chair, my understanding, no, it wasn't. Uh, would you like to speak to a Councillor Eason? Anyone speaking against? Anyone for? Councillor Sutherland. I'll just make a comment. I think the basketball and the volleyball were a wish list, probably on my behalf, <laughs> but rather than <laughs> the council or any um, the officers. But I do remember having a conversation, initial conversation on that, but nothing was put in stone. So, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Sutherland. Anyone wishing to speak against? Anyone for? If not, I'll go to the mover to close. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I think we were all sort of uh, in a Noranda Vibes conversations with uh, office staff and uh, in the groups and community that these items did come up and they were very, very well sought after items. Uh, and I think uh, Councillor Sutherland and myself and I'm sure others totally agree that we do need youth space there and we need basketball or volleyball. Uh, essentially, there's nothing there really for that type of exercise for youth. Um, so I'm hoping that you will um, uh, agree with this new limb and that it comes back and can be reported correctly because it does say here that that was complete and uh, I'd like it to be complete. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. So, councillors, that's all the items that's been pulled under Section 10. We'll now move to adopt the remaining items on block. Can I have a mover and seconder? Move Deputy Mayor, seconded Councillor Maleka. Put that straight to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. So we'll now move on to um, notice of motion. However, could I please have a mover and seconder to move discussion of item 11.1, .1, Councillor Eveson, potential naming of reserve. 33059 Bayswater to section 14, so it may be discussed behind closed doors. Can I have a mover? Count, moved by Councillor Clark, seconded Councillor Palmer. I'll put that straight to the vote. All those in favour? That is Councillors Maleka, Councillor Ostrzowski, Councillor Palmer, Councillor Eason, Councillor Sutherland, Councillor Clark, Councillor Johnson and myself. All those against? Deputy Mayor, Councillor peterson Pick, and Councillor Bull. So that is carried. So we now move on to item 11.2 um, and as this is my notice of motion, I will hand over chairing of the meeting to the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If you'd like to state your motion and is there a seconder for this? 
Councillor Eveson, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Sorry, just give me one sec. Thank you. So my notice of motion reads that council approves the time restriction detailed in the Bayswater Town Centre short-term parking, uh, short-term car parking management plan for two on-street car parking bays at the front of 19 Beachborough Road, South Bayswater to be changed from five hours to one hour. Uh, so councillors, I think this is a pretty straightforward notice of motion. I've been approached by the new businesses there. Um, it's a cafe coffee place and uh, there's ample five hour parking along Beachborough Road. You, you can go have a look. There's heaps of parking there at the five hour time limit. He's requested that we consider just two bays being updated to one hour so that it helps with the turnover of um, customers being able to find available parking if they just want to come in, pop in, grab a coffee and go so that there's you know a bit of turnover of parking. Um, so I'm, I think that there isn't any um, downsides uh, given the ample five hour parking there for the other businesses that require longer term customers. So I hope you all be supportive. Thank you. To the seconder. Uh, yeah, so look, I absolutely support this. It's an issue that was raised with me by the business owners uh, during conversation about the recent um, alfresco conditional approval process that the city rolled through. Yeah, that's the red, uh, red tape cutting work um, that was completed and helped support this business. So um, the previous parking plan that was uh, completed in 2019 and endorsed by council went through the usual consultation process. So the city has a recent and quite informed view. Um, and understanding on this matter and with the introduction of 3.8 Basie to our community and the roaring success of this business to date, it's clear, um, it's a clear show of support for the local businesses in our city. I'm supporting this motion as it's a low cost, low effort but high value change for this business, um, a change that will continue to support this and other surrounding local businesses during the very challenging period ahead for them in the Bayswater Town Centre. This motion is me measured and swift but also timely and I tip my cap to the Mayor for being so in touch with local needs and responding quickly to support them. Well done. For these reasons, I encourage my fellow councillors to support this motion. Thank you. Do we have a speaker for? A speaker against? A question, if I might, uh, to the uh, mover. Um, so, I understand, sorry, did you say the request for... Oh, it just seems to me like if it was coffee and you wanted a quick turnover, it'd be like 15 minutes or something, five minutes or something like that. So, is there a request for one hour come from the business owner themselves? Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Does anybody else wish to speak on this item? I'll go to the Mayor to close. Nothing to add. I'll put the item to the vote now. All those in favour? Mayor Piferetti, Councillor Maleka, oh, it's all unanimous. Thank you. And I'll hand now back to the Mayor. Thank you. So, Councillors, we now move on to item 11.3, which is Councillor Peterson Peak Safe Routes to School, Maylands Peninsula Primary School. Um, I'll just check if there's a seconder. Councillor Clark, Councillor Peterson Peak. Thank you. Um, look, in light of the petition um, that I presented uh, earlier this meeting and the fact that this is the first time that we are discussing this project during this term, I thought to also revisit some of the background behind of the project. Also, we have new councillors here. So in 2019, when I proposed this initiative before our previous council and received their full support, it was the first of its kind in Western Australia and maybe even in Australia as far as I know. The plan aimed to improve kids' safety and encourage more children and parents to walk, ride, and scoot to schools. Unlike various other initiatives, such as Your Move by the Department of Transport, our Safe Routes to School plan was intended to focus on our local government's responsibility to improve the infrastructure around schools or to lobby main roads to progress specific changes. We started with the Maylands Peninsula Primary School, as it is the second biggest primary school in Perth. It recently broke another record and now has more than 720 kids enrolled, 
who will start school tomorrow morning like many other kids around the city, and good luck to all of them. The numbers are just going up each year, and the need to improve the safety of the infrastructure around that school becomes more and more needed as more families come to Melons and Bayswater as a result of subdivisions and new developments approved by the city and the state government agencies. The work on this project has been a lengthy one and included consultation with various stakeholders, including the wider school community. Many parents submitted dozens of comments during the consultation, and there were even a few walking tours organized by parents. We finally reached the conclusive stage that everyone were looking for, including residents from other schools, as the Mellons Peninsula Primary School is our trial project. If we get the process right with this school, things will go even smoother when we will progress with other schools very soon. As I mentioned earlier this meeting, I presented a petition signed during school holidays by 245 people who expressed their frustration with the final document prepared. Last week, we also had a deputation from the school's principal who also mentioned the lack of transparency around sharing the detailed actions with everyone. It's not too late to fix things, and from reading the city's report, it looks like all the planned actions are already known to the officers and are already written somewhere. What I am proposing to Council is that we will provide the community with a proper plan as was envisaged when Council originally approved to progress with this project. It should look like any of our existing implementation plans for other areas, such as our car parking plans. It should include specific actions for implementation with specific locations requiring attention, including dangerous intersections and crossings, the lack of shade along various streets, and the need for some additional footpaths. This will be, as intended, a long-term plan, and I would like to stress that there shouldn't be any funding implications arising from this motion. Funding allocations, as always, will be determined during the budget deliberations. It's about having all the future actions written in a proper document that is access accessible to counselors, the school, and the wider community. And we can all follow the gradual implementation of the plan. This will show that this council is serious in supporting pedestrians and cyclists and children and trying to help reduce parking pressures around schools. I hope to get the support of everyone. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to second uh, this motion. And actually, before I forget, um, just looking at a map, I've actually got an impartiality interest to disclose. I've recently put my son on the list for the Nido Early School Maylands, which is near one of the lines on the map. Um, so I'm playing childcare lotto at the moment. Um, he may or may not attend that one. <laughs> um, but so that's the impartiality interest I'll disclose. But um, I think we've heard loud and clear from the people um, in this area um, that this is what they want. You know, the fact that there is such a clear petition um, with such a large number of people on it and such, you know, big engagement in this process. Um, and I think partly what we're starting to hear more and more from the community is that they don't want a plan for a plan. They actually want the action. They want to see the delivery on the ground. They want to be able to point to the tree, point to the new rubbish bin, point to the new footpath. Um, and having, you know, now pushed a pram along many of those footpaths, it has fundamentally changed <laughs> how I look at our footpaths. Um, so... So I think we really need to, to, to do this and we need to deliver it. Um, and, and whilst you always need to have the plan, um, I think part of what people are wanting to see and what I keep hearing time and time again from the community is that they, they just want to get it done. They, just want, they don't want to see another implementation plan, you know, another plan for a plan. They just want to see the delivery on the ground. They want to know when it's happening um, and see that change in their community. So I hope everyone supports this. Thank you. Councillor Sazowski? Uh, thank you. Um, just looking at limb number two, I'm wondering if the, the mover and the seconder might consider just changing the words uh, for approval to for consideration. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'll just check with the seconder. Councillor Clark, are you happy with that? Yes? Okay. So I'll just get the minute taker to um, change that one word. Are you happy with that, Councillor Peterson Pick? Yep, Councillor Clark. Okay, Councillor Osazowski, would you wish to speak on this? 
Um, I'm happy to, to support this and I'm glad that we're able to change that because I'd like to think that we're able to make a decision on the implementation plan at that May meeting. Um, I'd hate for a terrible plan to come back and us for, you know, us to approve it. So I want to make sure it's right before we actually go ahead. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone speaking against? Anyone for? Councillor Sutherland. Yeah, I think uh, this is a good idea. As the um, move of this motion said, uh, Maylands is one of the biggest schools now, primary schools in the state and or in, in Perth, not, I suppose not the state, but in Perth. Uh, and it's in a city area with small blocks. I think it's important that we start encouraging young children to walk to um, school uh, because I'm on the other side, they're older. And if they've got a good grounding when they're young, they're used to riding to school, that sort of thing, they keep doing it till um, in high school and they've got those skills for the rest of their life. Um, and you can't underestimate the education you get walking to school. Um, and I think it's a, a, it's a great thing, great investment. Uh, and it, this one particularly has really been led um, by obviously council but also the communities. So it's one of those things where both of them mesh together, come together. So, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Anyone speaking against? Anyone for? Councillor Johnson. Thank you. I think 2019, whole generations of children will go through the school before we make it safer. And I hope we can do it as soon as possible because I have ridden around this area and I've walked around this area and I probably wouldn't send my kids riding there by themselves. Um, so lots of near misses in my area. There's lots more we can do to make it indeed a safe route to school. And um, we're not there yet. So um, it'd be really great. I mean, I think this was a trial when it was started and it would be a really great template to roll out to all of our schools. Thank you. Anyone speaking against? Anyone for? If not, I'll go to the move to close. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. We now move on to item 11.4, uh, Councillor Bull funding for infant imp immunisation service in 2023-24 budget. Um, I'll just see if there's a seconder. Councillor Clark, Councillor Bull. No, 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 you take it. No, I'm happy. Uh, I've, I've ruled Councillor Clark. Councillor Clark, go ahead. So Councillor Bull, seconded Councillor Clark. Okay. The council resolves to request that the CEO includes in the draft of the budget for the 2023-24, um, sorry, for 2023-24, the reintroduction of an infant immunisation service for further consideration by the council as part of the annual business planning and budgeting process. So last year when council implemented a budget that immediately cancelled the infant immunisation service, I believe it made a mistake. That was both the decision itself and the way Council went about it. But tonight we have an opportunity to rectify that. The infant immunisation program is one that directly supports our local community, something I believe all councillors want to do, that is support our local community. In fact, we saw it in the way that Council voted to support children in the last motion. Here we have the opportunity to support young families again, young children and infants. I think we can all agree that we want, as a council, to support these locals. This program supports vulnerable people, people without transport, people who can't access bulk billing services, and people who can't access Medicare. The city is a proud refugee welcome zone. This program supports refugee families. So here is an opportunity to do more than just roll out the slogan. We can tangibly support refugees, thereby showing we are, in fact, a refugee welcome zone. This deeply valued service was immunising 750 to 1,000 infants each year. Given we know that the district is home to a little over 4,000 children between the ages of zero and four, it critically highlights this important service. So councillors, here is an opportunity to set a previous decision right. And so I ask you to tangibly show our community that you do support it and support my motion tonight. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, since, uh, since the decision was previously made, I've actually received a number of comments and 
contact, you know, emails and contact with from a number of people who have actually explain, explained in quite a lot of detail the impact that this has. And I think, I think this idea that there's sort of, oh, it's just duplication, there's double ups, there's someone else down the road doing it, hasn't actually played out in reality. So, so if you picture it, you know, you've you've got you know a four year old and a two year old, and you've got a four month old, and you are trying to somehow get into a GP, which um, in and of itself at the moment, I mean, try and get into a bulk billing GP um, around here, and I don't think, I think you'd really struggle, um, and you end up just having to wait <laughs> all day uh, and wait for hours and or, or not get in at all. And the difficulty with some of these immunisations is they've got to be done within a set time frame, right? They've got to be done within the week from which the baby is born. Um, so, so you can't just sort of say, oh, I'll put it off till next week and wait till a, you know, a bulk billing appointment turns up. It's also about the geography of it, where these are, where they were previously located were quick and easy to literally walk down the road, um, catch the train to and from, catch a bus to and from. Um, so I think, I think we, the, the risk is that we actually have n high numbers of children who don't end up getting any immunisations because there are families that just don't quite get round to it and they don't end up going somewhere else um, and they don't spend money that they don't have, um, you know, because you walk into a non-bulk billing GP and you're never actually quite sure how much you're going to get charged some days, um, which I find a funny thing. I've, I've walked in thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to get charged this today and then been charged nothing and then vice versa. Um, now with a child, some stuff gets put through Medicare free for him and some of it doesn't. And I cannot find a rhyme or reason as to what that's going to be. I can't predict that. Now, I'm lucky enough to have the spare money in my bank account to be able to pay it if I need to pay it at the end of the appointment. But there are many people, particularly at the moment with cost of living um, and with mortgages going up and rents increasing, who will not have that spare cash. Um, so they just won't immunise their child. Um, and I think post-COVID, um, this, this needs to be what we do because what we're now seeing is a rise in manager cockle as well. Um, and interestingly, I assumed that manager cockle would just be an automatic uh, part of the immunisation schedule, it's not. You have to pay for it, right? I spent 180 bucks the other week on it. So, so again, if you don't have that money, um, then then you're you're not you're not getting it. Um, so, as soon as you start to get those rates dipping, we then have more children who are at risk and who are getting sick, and it costs our health system down the track. We might not see it on our budget, but it is in a budget and it costs the community and it costs um, someone down the track when, when children get sick and when they're, you know, in our childcare centres um, locally. So I think for the sake of what is $120,000 um, and, and, you know, you can sit down and look at our budget line by line, which we do most years and I think we should do again, we can find $120,000. We can find it in things like, you know, reducing you know, the drinks that get served at the councillor bar behind me, um, reducing, um, you know, a range of different costs or underspends where, where, we, where the money is not spend it, spent and we, we roll it over year on year because we have huge rollovers. Um, so I really would implore councillors to think about this really carefully. I think we need to have more discussions about it in our budget um, negotiations and discussions um, and uh, work out how to do it. And I think we need to be liaising much more closely uh, with, with the state government and their, and their services um, in terms of how they're delivering, um, delivering things. Um, but, but at the end of the day, we had, a thing, we had something that was working quite well and, and we need to make sure that these children are immunised. Um, so I would like to see it back and happening um, and, and happening um, po possibly with improvements. You know, like, let's look at this afresh and let's look at how we deliver these services for people um, so that every child gets immunised. Thank you. Would anyone like to speak against? Councillor Maleka. Could I just ask a question first? Um, did our service provide the meningococcal vaccination as well? I'll go to the director. Through the chair, I think it did. Okay. Um, yeah, I know the, the school program still continues to provide, is provided by the state government, um, but with the clinics, I'm not sure, but I know the state um, the school program still does. Thank you. Thank you. Do you wish to speak on the Yes, item? thank you. Go ahead. Um, Yes, I don't feel I can support this item. Um, the fact is that the immunisation service does exist. It's provided through the National Immunisation Program. And so it's the, respon the responsibility no longer lies with um, local government. 
um, removing the immunisation um, from our schedule was a well-informed decision. It demonstrates that we are removing a duplication of service. And as we can see from the officer's report, all but one local government um, in the metro area has come to that same realisation. And yes, when you have a child, you need to book them in at a six week or a 12 week or, or whatever the case may be to book them in for that vaccination, but that can be booked well in advance. As um, Councillor Clark mentioned, it could be difficult to get yourself into a GP, but we do know when those vaccinations need to occur. So they could be booked well in advance. And, and so, in my opinion, the service already exists and there's no need for us to duplicate this. Thank you. Councillor Palmer speaking for? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask that we have a list on page 618? And uh, is this the list that used to be our vaccination list? I'll go to the, the director. Through the chair, that's the list of, um, yes, in terms of the program, which it previously comprised of the, um, the school program plus the clinics. Thank you. Uh, so on there, it's got meningococcal group, ACYWI. I'm not a doctor, so I'm assuming meningococcal is on that list and so is pneumococcal uh, and others. So there's uh, quite a lot there. Uh, I feel that uh, we can't become a bread and circuses type of city of Bayswater, where we're quite happy to put big money into events all over the city. And yet when we come to our children, uh, the mere amount of 120 seems difficult to find. We had clinics like a network smoothly put through the city of Bayswater, and at this moment in time, it would be very good to resurrect again. It may take a couple of months to get in situ the right employment. We know that. It's not going to be that easy, but it's not that difficult to do either. And if we're doing it for our children, if we can't do this for our children, why are we even bothering sitting here? Uh, so I just feel it's very necessary. It's our future, it's our children, and the list there of the diseases that we are uh, assisting in preventing our children getting uh, is ultra. And uh, as uh, Councillor Clark has said, to actually make an appointment to try and get a doctor for one injection, let alone the amount that we normally give in the uh, vaccination clinics, uh, is going to be very difficult, especially when you have more than one child. Um, I haven't been injected when I was young on polio because my mum didn't have time to take me. Uh, so, you know, these things happen, and that will happen occurringly, constantly. And I think if we can avoid and defend our children and event, uh, you know, prevent any illness, uh, just one child preventing them getting meningococcal would be worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone speaking against? Yeah. Councillor Sutherland. Um, I am because I think time moves on. This immunisation program from the council is a legacy from years ago. Uh, now time goes on. We've got the national one. Um, we have got a lot of local um, local clinics, immunisation um, clinics around Perth, in, in, in especially in the local area that people can go to and um, as we've said there is a time people know when their child should be immunised they can make appointments months in advance. Um, I also would take this time to think we our, our budget I know it's not a lot of money but we've just put um, you know we're going to look at a bud, uh, money in the budget for uh, walking to school program which is I think just as important um, so we don't have money for everything. We have got a very obviously, um, you know, a difficult period and road ahead. And I think we have to um, look uh, at things. We don't need to do this. We also have a local member, or where I live in that local member, who's the health minister. So maybe we could um, get them, uh, the council, to lobby to have another clinic in the local area if we haven't got enough clinics. But I think um, it's, a, as I said, a legacy from years gone by. It's not our um, function, local government function, to do this. Uh, so um, I can't support it. Thank you. Anyone speaking for? Councillor Johnson. 
Thank you. Um, I agree with Councillor Sutherland. It is a legacy uh, thing. It comes from our public health and wellbeing plan, um, which is still current and it's got immunisation and it's also got handing out rat baits, um, so which is also a legacy project. Um, I think um, it comes under the box in our public health plan, public health and wellbeing plan for um, healthy and sustainable environments, and it's part of maintaining public health standards within the community. Um, free immunisation, freely and readily available immunisation, is is not freely and readily available for everybody. It's not so easy. We heard um, a lot of people talk about how um, going to their local clinic. Uh, immunisation clinic was a sort of a segue into other um, health supports and infant health supports and um, I, I think that's a really important thing that we can offer at, um, our community and young families, increasing numbers of young families if you look at the census data. Um, I, I think this is just a small thing that we can do to increase the uh, health of our community and preventative health um, and to support this one. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone speaking? against Councillor Ossozowski. Uh, thank you. Um, just in regards to the comments uh, Councillor Johnson just made about the public health and wellbeing plan, um, that is a document that is, is uh, 2019 through uh, 2024 and yes, the vaccination component um, has been in there um, uh, and it has been a legacy issue and the actual, um, the plan uh, actually says that the focus on the plan should be around, it should be actually be around diabetes, heart disease, cancer, current respiratory issues, um, arthritis, osteoporosis, injury, mental health, and um, uh, people with um, poor self-health assessments. So the um, vaccination um, component has been something that has been in that plan ongoing because there were issues with vaccination many, many years ago. Um, interestingly, um, councillors just in one of our uh, previous items in one of our quarterly reports which went to the audit committee and has come back tonight for council endorsement one of the actions in the health uh, plan is reviewed every year and um, one of the actions in uh, that quarterly review that we've all just approved all of the councillors who have spoken for this have just approved is to remove vaccinations from the health plan so because that has been endorsed by council that actually will be removed from the health plan for the remainder of this year so the public health and well-being plan actually no longer um, uh, asks for us to be looking at vaccination so I'm confused now that councillors have just approved to not do vaccinations but now we're asking to do vaccinations so at this stage I can't support this motion Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, just a question. That actually does raise a really good point because um, it is there on page 10 of the attachment from that previous item. Um, so I suppose a question through to governance or to CO, uh, does that then make this motion ultra vires because we've just approved to remove it from the health plan? I'll go to the CO. <laughs> yeah. Through the chair, can um, the director clarify in the health plan the exact component that has been removed and then we can assess that against what's actually being debated in the notice of motion raised by Councillor Bull? So at the top of the page, it says provision of immunisation clinics. Yeah. Through the, through the Mayor, in, in consultation with the Manager of Governance, the, the notice of motion is talking about a consideration within the budget. So in terms of it being ultra vires would be uh, a point to um, consider if it was adopted as part of the budget. But the notice of motion is just for consideration, so it wouldn't be at this point in time. So we'll just continue with the debate. Deputy Mayor, do you wish to speak? No, no. I no. Don't okay. Thank you. Um, so, do I have a speaker for? Do I have a speaker against? Yep, might as well. Councillor Eason. Yep. So look, I'm, I'm not going to support this motion, and it's not that I don't agree with immunisation um, being a good thing. It is. I agree with that. I've got three young children who are all immunised and some use the service and others we actually opted to use our GP because it was easier with three children to book ahead. 
Um, I also agree that schooling is good, but I also don't agree that the local that the council should fund schooling either in the district. The key reason I'm not going to support this motion is because it's not the responsibility of a local government, and we are contributing ratepayer money to a responsibility that is provided for free by other levels of, of government. With significant financial pressures facing households across our district, reintroducing this financial cost is not necessary. The service is already provided free elsewhere. If there is a concern and an accessibility issue, then I suggest we lobby our local member, whom is also the health minister for this state, to improve, the, improve that situation by funding a state-run clinic within the city. My last point on this item, financial sustainability, a matter that council needs to take very seriously, the Paxson report with its finding and recommendations. In 2020, some councillors around this table were privy to a report by the Paxson Group which highlighted huge concerns about the financial sustainability of this city. Last year's Sorry, budget. Councillor Eason, you need to stop. What's the point of order? Sorry, Councillor Eason, can you turn your mic off? Councillor Clark? Uh, I believe those statements are highly misleading. So the Paxton report was available to all of Council. We've been through this previously. Audit reports are presented to all of Council. That was previously provided. So um, I, I, know, I know under the new Code of Conduct, it is a breach of the code to mislead this chamber. So perhaps Councillor Eveson would like to rephrase what he's just said. Councillor Clark, um, thank you for your point of order. I don't believe it is a point of order because I am aware that the report was not provided to all councillors. Yes, Please continue. It wasn't. Please oh, continue, Councillor Eason. Order. The report, the report formed part of an audit and risk um, uh, set of minutes that was... What's a, the what, point of order? The, the point of order is misleading again. The audit and risk report... Sorry, the audit and risk agenda and minutes were provided to all councillors and made accessible to all councillors. Councillor Bull, I've already ruled on the point of order of misleading... Councillor Eason. No, 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 my point of order is a, is a different point of order. It's in relation to what you just said. So it's a dissent? It's a dissent. It is not it, it is not dissent. I am I am not seeking any dissent. It's a point of order for misleading the chamber by saying that not all councillors had access to the report. I've ruled on that, Councillor Bull. Uh, Mayor, I'd Councillor, like to call Councillor attention Clark. to a breach under section 9.4 of the standing orders. Councillor Clark, sorry. I would like to call attention to a breach. A member may at any time under draw attention of the presiding member to any breach of this local law, 9.4. I would ask that Councillor Eveson would rephrase his comments about what occurred in the past, because they are not accurate or true. Councillor Clark, I've just sought advice from governance. I've made a ruling on your point of order. Councillor Bull, you're doing a point of order on my ruling, so I'll ask the Deputy Mayor to rule on that. On, on what basis? So on your point of order that my comments were misleading, so I'm asking the Deputy Mayor to rule on that. On what basis? Or the alternative is I rule on my own point of order that you've called on me. So my question is on what basis are you asking the Deputy Mayor to rule? As I'll be it is handing the over, I'm handing over the chairing of the meeting when a point of order is called on me, so I don't rule on my own points of order in on, terms of governance. I understand that. My question is, on what basis can you hand the presiding power across to the Deputy Mayor? I'll go to the governance manager to respond to that. So the standing orders uh, do not have a specific provision to hand over the presiding of the meeting to the Deputy Mayor. The, what the Mayor is suggesting is that when a councillor calls a point of order against her as a member in the chamber, um, 
there could, there could be a perception that she can't make a ruling that is impartial on a matter that, ref, that refers to herself. Um, I, I accept that there's not a specific provision in the standing orders to do that, but when there isn't a specific provision in the standing orders to, to make a ruling or to decide a question in relation to meeting procedures, then again the, the, the presiding member um, is to answer those questions. If I, I can refer you to section... Uh, 17.3, which says cases not provided for in the local law. So it's not provided for in the local law a presiding member ruling on a point of order that has to do with them. Uh, my suggestion to the Mayor is that it is more appropriate for uh, the Deputy Mayor to make a ruling on a point of order against the Mayor. Alternatively, you could move a motion of dissent, Councillor. Could it also potentially be under the Local Government Act where the presiding, where the mayor's presiding member is not willing to stay in the chair that she could hand it to the deputy mayor? That's correct. Mayor? So the mayor has said that she would prefer for the deputy mayor to make a ruling on the point of order raised by Councillor Bull that the that Councillor Pafferetti misled uh, the Chamber with her comments. Mayor, I'd like to seek to make a personal explanation under section 8.12 of the local laws. I, th I think I've just handed over the chairing of the meeting. I, I, whoever is chairing, it would help if you sat in, actually up in the chair because then you could see everyone and chair properly. But For a moment, please. Thank you. Um, I'll just quickly go to Councillor Eveson because I believe he wishes to say something. Yep. I'll, uh, I'll retract that statement and I'll change change the statement uh, if you'd wish. It helps. Chair, I would like to seek to make a personal explanation under section 8.12 of our standing orders. You could read please. Right. Sorry, there seems to be a problem. Through the, through the Deputy Mayor Chair, um, I'd just like to suggest that you need to deal with Councillor Ball's point of order first. Once you've dealt with that, then I, then I would suggest that you could deal with um, the personal explanation from Councillor Clark, unless Councillor Clark's personal explanation relates to uh, the point of order for Councillor Ball. This is just getting way too messy. <clears throat> I rule that there is no breach on that. So Councillor Clark, Councillor Eveson has retracted his original statement. If you'd like to make your personal explanation. Thank you, Acting Chair. Very briefly, this idea that somehow some councillors around this table hid a report from other councillors, I find wholly offensive and untrue. And on our hand back to the mayor. Thank you. Councillor Clark, I believe Councillor Eason has offered to with retract his statement. Councillor Eason? Uh, yep. So I don't need to say anything. Sorry, what's next? I can just continue. Continue. You've Thank retracted you. your statement. Yep. All right, thanks. So the Paxson report highlighted huge financial uh, concerns about the financial sustainability Adrian, of the order. city. Councillor Eason, please turn off your mic. I'd, I'd like to ask the governance officer or the CEO, perhaps through the chair, how now any of these comments or statements can be minuted or documented because the statement has been made and is out there in the public domain and whilst I thank Councillor Everson for retracting those comments, I think it's incumbent upon all councillors to be very careful about what they say around this table, particularly since it's an election year this year. I'll go to the CEO. Yeah, th through the chair, the process, councillors, is a point of order was called. It's been ruled on. The councillor concerned in relation to the comments that was made has now actually withdrawn those comments, and that is on the public record. So that is clarified, and now the councillor can continue with the remainder of that debate, having made that apology and retracted, retracted those comments. Councillor Eason, please continue. Yep. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll... 
just say, so the Paxson report highlighted huge concerns about the financial sustainability of the city. And last year's budget adopted for this financial year was the first real attempt to council to rein in unnecessary, unnecessary spending in an effort to work towards a sustainable future for our city. The Paxton report reflected this need to change and this new council responded in line with what was needed. Councillor Eveson, um, please turn off your mic. Councillor Bull, what's the point of order? This is based on a point of order that you um, ruled in last month, um, relevance. Uh, last month, I recall uh, Councillor Peterson pick on an item to do with a planning decision on um, a childcare centre in Naranda and the question of whether bicycle racks should be part of it. He made a reference to a Maylands childcare centre that didn't have bicycle racks and you ruled that as not relevant. In this instance, uh, Councillor Eveson is talking about the budget and finance, not talking about this motion. And so I would, um, I would say that is also not relevant. Councillor Bull, um, there is no, I don't agree with your point of order because the, the motion in front of us talks about consideration in the draft budget. So it is a budget and budget process. In the same way that the motion that Councillor Peterson picked. Councillor Bull, I've ruled was... on your note, I've ruled on your point of order. Councillor Eveson, please continue. Okay. So talked about reigning and unnecessary spending. The Paxton report also reflected the need to change and this new council responded in line with what was needed, living within our means and a focus on core services. Now we have this motion in front of us, taking us asking us to take a step backward to use ratepayer monies towards a service which is readily accessible and provided for free by other levels of government. We need to be planning for the city's future, not going backwards. Thank you. Anyone speaking for? Councillor peterson Pick. I'd like to uh, have a question, if I can. Go ahead. Um, to the officers, please. Um, what um, was the impact of the closure of our immunisation clinics? I'll go to the director. Through the chair, we haven't measured what the impact has been. Haven't? We have not measured. Okay. Just on that basis, I will support this motion. Um, I don't know how the councillors cannot support this if the city has not measured something that we have been providing for many, many years. Um, I, I think this is very bad uh, governance and policy making um, as a general comment. Um, we are talking about immunizations uh, for infants. Just want to remind councillors the topic. Um, I think it should be measured. I think it should be surveyed. I think we should talk to migrants, refugees. I think we should talk to those who rent the clinics. I want to understand if those who um, seek the service found all the GP appointments that they need, or if not, uh, what does it mean? Have they not immunize, immunized uh, their kids? Um, did they go to the free uh, metro immunization clinics that some people uh, were talking about here, and none of them uh, are located in the city of Bayswater? So people with infants, and I remember those days very vividly, um, needed to take, some of them probably, um, public transport to other cities um, people, let's say, for Molly, will need to travel to East Perth, for example, or to West Perth um, to get that free vaccination. Um, many people talked about lobbying, the member, the minister. Um, that should have been done, in my view, before we closed the immunization clinics. That work should have been done by the council um, properly, um, set uh, all the infrastructure and lobby uh, what needs to be done before we uh, create this impact that we are not even un unsure what the impact is. Um, I think it is um, very concerning that the, Depart the state government who are responsible for health um, do not provide us any assistance. Still, the report saying that they will not provide any assistance um, and they are not planning to set up any a free metro immunization clinic in the city of Bayswater. I think this should be supported so the issue is on the table, should be considered not only during budget time, but should be considered in general. I would like to see a report about the impact and discussions should be held um, with the city uh, and hopefully the mayor uh, with the minister and see um, where a, a free metro immunization clinic is going to be um, erected 
um, and I think the city in the city of Bayswell, and I think the city should provide a venue for that. I think this is an example of collaboration between state government and local government that you should have on this in this issue. But just to to dump it on the side on the basis that we have a budget, come on, we. I don't want to re uh, repeat all the items that we are considering here every month and the budget and the clubs and all that stuff. The issue here, and I want it on the record, is that no one here in the public gallery is talking about this issue. If we had a full public gallery, like many other items, council would have never, never stopped those clinics. So we need to remember the, uh, the people who used it. Many of them are migrants. And we just celebrated, right, just recently you know, the um, citizenship ceremony. We're talking about those people, We're talking about the refugees and those from low socioeconomic families. Those are the ones who might need it the most and they do not have the time, um, the ability, or even the awareness that they need to come here tonight and lobby uh, for the sake of their kids. So it is upon us to remember um, the, um, the, um, the group that is behind this motion. So I would like to see much more information before we can actually conclude uh, finally with this issue. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak on this who hasn't already spoken? I would like to enter debate. So I will hand over the chairing responsibility to the deputy mayor. Maybe Freddie. Thank you. When I was elected mayor, I promised change and that change extends to financial reform. Where we are a council that spends our ratepayers' monies with the utmost thought and consideration in a responsible and sustainable way and on services which are the remit of local government. We cannot be everything and anything to everyone. And it's going to take years of diligence and restraint to rectify the financial issues this council has inherited and ensure we continue to deliver the community services our community expect from their local government, not from their state or federal government. This next 12 months is going to be particularly hard financially for the city as we need to find millions of dollars for a new ERP system, ensure our valued community facilities such as the Rise, Morley Rec and Bayswater Waves keep operating whilst losing significant sums of money, replenish our reserves that have been stripped of millions due to the COVID stimulation package, and let's not forget about the EBA negotiations currently underway with our workforce that will certainly have huge ongoing financial impacts for the city. So until this council is in a position where we are financially sustainable, it would be irresponsible for me to support funding a service with ratepayer money, effectively taxing them twice for a service which is the primary responsibility of other levels of government. I also want to address some of the comments about refugees. Um, I don't know how many other councillors around this table have relatives or relatives of relatives that are refugees. I do, and you've all you're all aware of that. My sister-in-law's sister is a refugee here. Guess what? She has a Medicare card. They're all given Medicare cards. And if you go onto the National Immunisation Program website to find out information about accessing the National Immunisation Program vaccines, it clearly says on their website, the program also covers catch-up vaccinations if any were missed in childhood for people, for refugees and humanitarian entrants of any age. That's on the website. I don't have anything else to add. Thank you, and I'll hand back Cherry. Thank you. I'll go to the mover to close. Thank you for that. Um, I honestly don't understand how this issue has become the poster's child for fiscal conservatism. It's 0.15% of our budget. If you approach our budget as the $80 million budget, not including um, aged care, in which case it's even less. I don't understand how 0.15% of our budget is going to 
um, cutting that is going to achieve the things that the Mayor just rattled off. But the um, point is that this is local. It supports people who are unable to access the state service. It's, uh, it, the easier it is to access the service, the greater chance people will get their children vaccinated. And we want all of our children, all of the children in our district to be vaccinated. That's what this is about. And irrespective of whether this should be delivered at what tier of government, right here and now, there are a bunch of people who can't access immunisation services right here and now as a consequence of the last budget decision. So the question as to whether uh, we do this or not based on what other councils do is actually not the Bayswater way. Council didn't hesitate to provide skip bins because other councils didn't provide skip bins. We didn't not move to FOGO because other councils didn't want to and still don't want to move to FOGO. And the fact that Belmont got rid of Ascot Water Playground didn't stop council putting a significant amount of money on the budget four years ago to help deliver an improved Maylands Bayswater. So fun fundamentally, do we want to support our local community? I'm confident that this council genuinely does want to. So let's support younger children today and their health and support this motion. Thank you. I'll now put this to the vote. All those in favour? That's Councillor Palmer, Councillor Peterson Pitt, Councillor Bull, Councillor Clark, Councillor Johnson. All those against? Councillor Maleka, Councillor Ossozowski, Councillor Eason, Councillor Sutherland, Deputy Mayor, and myself. That is lost. So, Councillors, we now move on to item 12 questions from members without notice. Are there any questions from members? Councillor Peterson Peake. Thank you. I would like to understand, and I did ask about this, I think, six months ago, what the status of the electronic system for uh, petitions that was already approved by the council two years ago, maybe? I'll go to the um, manager for governance. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, that work is progressing and it is getting very close. We've just had some um, resourcing challenges in the last couple of months, but we're nearly we're nearly there. Thank you very much. Any other questions, Councillor Eveson? Yeah, I've got I've got a couple. Um, just uh, following on from a question asked in December OCM, had, was there any further updates regarding the proposal uh, proposals or potential proposals for the Galleria redevelopment? I'll go to the director. Thank you. Through the chair, um, there's been no further update um, regarding any proposals for the redevelopment of Galleria Shopping Centre. Thank you. Um, noting my question from the December OCM as well, um, regarding the interim economic development strategy, councillors were provided an update via memo, which outlined works completed since the endorsement in April 22. Um, can the city pl provide some guidance on um, when we're going to adequately resource this uh, highly important area? I'll go to the director. Um, through the chair, um, since um, there was a resignation of the incumbent for the Economic Development Advisor whose prime role was to um, implement the interim economic development strategy, that was um, that position was vacated in December. Um, we have recruited um, the process, gone through recruitment process. We have appointed um, a, a new incumbent and that person's actually starting tomorrow. Oh, um, and that person um, prime um, prime role is to, and function and priority is to implement the interim economic development strategy. Awesome, thanks. Um, last one. Oh, actually, sorry, I got one that came up as well. But uh, so just a, this is a follow-up in the Neat Streets campaign for the Bayswater industrial area. Um, there was a suggest suggestion from the feedback or the answer I got uh, last month um, that patrols have increased. Are these patrols looking to address ongoing infringements of city bylaws regarding forklift unloading in the street and rubbish dumping on verges on public land, etc.? I'll go to the director. Um, through the chair, um, it is. Um, it's, it's, we are um, basically, there has been some complaints and we are acting on it um, promptly. There's also been recent complaints about um, litter 
Um, there's been two occasions the last couple of months and we have acted promptly on those two. Um, and one which actually just came through at the start of the meeting on, on social media, but um, just the, the Naranda Station, there's a, a Banara Road closure which was just, an, I mean, announced today, and this is probably for, for Doug, um, but was there any movement on the traffic lights? There's a Condition 9 on that DA, just in regards to putting traffic lights on Banara? I'll go to the Director. Yes, through the Chair, one of the conditions that were put on the development approval was that they need to further investigate the provision of traffic signals uh, for the access to the train station off Banara Road. So there has been further investigation and further work done on that. I know they're progressing a design, so it looks more positive than it was previously. Uh, so we're hoping to get an update from the consultant team within the next few weeks, I'd suggest. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Yes. Oh, please. sorry, Councillor Ossadowski. Thank you. Um, can we please be provided, and this is in particular for the residents who live uh, around uh, Joan Rycroft Reserve, um, pre please be provided an update on where we're up to with the concrete batching plant and our last council decision on that item. I'll go to the director. Through the chair, um, there is a, a directions hearing um, in February. I haven't got the exact date by note. So it's uh, 17th. the 17th of February. Um, so that will then determine um, the next steps in terms of the hearing for the concrete batching plant. Do we have any information on, on what that direction hearing is going to look like, what, what they'll be talking about? Through the chair, um, there may be, um, the applicants may look at the mediation, request a mediation. Um, that will be up to the um, State Administrative tri Tribunal whether they're prepared to ensure that happens. And one more question, then you, you mentioned mediation. Mediation on what? In terms of, my understanding, in terms of addressing the concerns of council, um, which my, my recollection was mainly in terms of noise. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? No, we'll move on to item 13, new business of an urgent nature of which there is none this evening. So we'll now move on to item 14, confidential items. We have six confidential items this evening. Can I please have a mover and seconder to go behind closed doors? Move Councillor Bull, seconded Councillor Maleka. I'll put that straight to the vote. All those in favour? That is Councillors Maleka, Councillor Palmer, Councillor Eason, Councillor Sutherland, Councillor Bull, Councillor Clark, Councillor Johnson and myself. All those against? It's Councillor Ossazowski and Councillor Peterson Pick. So we'll start with um, item 11.1, which
Thank you. Oh, sorry. Councillors, I'll now close this meeting at 11.10pm. Thank you.